Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace be upon us all. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, the Executive Deputy Chairman of RSIS, and Associate Professor Leonard Sebastian, head of the Indonesia program for organizing this event. I am truly honored to speak at this prestigious forum, and I am very happy to be able to contribute in the efforts of strengthening the relations between Indonesia and Singapore. I am proud to be part of the RSIS alumni that actively promotes the wisdom and virtues for social changes for towards a better world. As I took the car ride from the airport to the city center, I could not help but reminisce the days when I used to live here in Singapore as a postgraduate student. The days when Pat Leonard used to teach and engage us in lively discussions about the state and politics in modern Indonesia. Of course, Life was much simpler back then as a student, and I do miss those days sometimes. At the same time, the city of Singapore also provided me with an illustration of modern urban developments, the advanced public infrastructure, the long-term city planning, the vibrant economy, and the trading hub between the East and the West, as well as the numerous R&D centers established here. I learned many things during my days here, both within and outside the campus. Today, I would like to discuss the outlook of Indonesia's young generation, its challenges and opportunities in a vibrant democracy. Indonesia has around 260 million population, comprising more than 300 ethnic groups, spread across 17,000 islands and three time zones from Sabang in the west to Papua or to Merauke in the east, from Miangas in the north to the island of Rote in the south. It is a vast country with highly diverse cultures, and it is also a country replete with potentials. The largest potential would be its young demographics. The country's median age is 28.6 years, this indicates a potentially large workforce to sustain continuing economic growth going forward. Of course, that can only happen when such workforce gains higher skills and productivity. The Indonesian economy today is the world's 16th largest economy. A study by McKinsey projected the country to become the seventh largest economy by 2030. Another study by PricewaterhouseCoopers went as far as to forecast that by 2050, Indonesia could be the fourth largest economy in the world. Certainly, Indonesia has plenty of reasons for great hopes. It is with these hopes that we have set a vision for Indonesia 2045, a developed country that is just and prosperous, a strong democracy, and an active global power. Obviously, there is much to do for Indonesia to get there. But before we understand what it will take and how Indonesia can get there, let us backtrack a little and go back briefly in time. The story of Indonesia is a story of successive leadership in the, in the 72 years since the founding of the Republic. President Joko Widodo, can focus on infrastructure developments today because President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono had previously ensured sound economic fundamentals and stability of the country in terms of politics as well as security. President Yudhoyono was able to deliver on economic growth, democracy, and international cooperation because of the foundations laid down by President Abdurrahman Wahid and President Megawati Soekarno Putri. President Wahid, President Megawati, as well as President Habibie, previously 
have managed to normalize the country in the aftermath of the political crisis of 1998 and consolidate its transition to a full-fledged democracy. President Suharto, for 32 years, set the direction for national economic development to take place across the country. And when the country was at the brink of a serious and severe crisis, he chose to step down for the good of the country. And before then, President Sukarno brought the people of Indonesia to the state of independence. He unified and kept the country together despite numerous separatist attempts from within and threats from external powers. This reflects the different generational leadership and the true meaning of continuity and change. To build upon what the previous generation has done, to continue on with what has proved good for the country and its people, as well as the willingness to adapt and improve on the aspects that are needed in light of the future challenges. Indonesia's young generation need to have an understanding and appreciation of the past journey of our nation. We can only go to where we want to if we understand where we have been. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share some personal stories of my own. I had previously been a career military officer for almost my entire adult life. From the years back at the military academy up to the point in September 2016 when I was nominated as governor candidate for the capital region of Jakarta. The decision to leave active military service was not really planned ahead and certainly was not an easy one. But if I were to look back now, I have no regret, regret of that decision. The main reason of my joining politics was because of my conviction to serve the interests of the country through the best means possible. I always believe in serving for a greater cause. That was also the reason I had joined the military in the first place. So personally, I see my current track as a continuation of the same calling. Surely, the world of politics is a new and different track for me, but the basic principles remain. Duty, honor, country. These are the key lessons I derive from my years of service in the Army. They helped build my characters, and I remain committed to these principles. Well, the biggest difference between military world and politics, when you are in the military, you know where your enemy is. We are here with the uh, certain uniform, and your enemy is in front of you with different uniform. Well, in politics, your enemy can be everywhere, can be right beside you, behind you, or in front of you. So you see, politics is much more complicated than military world. My joining politics also serves as a reminder to young people that we have a duty, a moral obligation, to, tear, to care for and serve a greater cause, and that we can undertake that duty with honorable conduct, all for the betterment of our country for generations to come. During the Jakarta uh, race in 2017, there were heightened concerns of the use of politics of identity. Some of you here, I'm sure, are familiar with the stories coming out of Jakarta around that period. The issues of religion became front and center of the contest rather than merits, programs, and ideas. And this was not limited to the people in Jakarta only. Our country as a whole indeed faced a true test of our democracy. An unseen line seems to divide our people into two polars. One is pro-Bineka and one is pro-Islam. When you are pro-Bineka, which refers to our national motto, Bineka Tunggal Ika, or unity in diversity, then you are labeled as if you are not a good Muslim. And when you are pro-Islam, then you are labeled as if you are intolerant. I strongly disagree with such views. There is no need for clash between Islam and Bineka. You can be both a devout Muslim 
and live in harmony side by side with tolerance with people of other religious backgrounds. The long experience of our people, even prior to the founding of the Republic, has demonstrated this. As a governor candidate, I had first-hand experience throughout this process. It was painful to see how, in the name of politics, certain group was prepared to do whatever necessary to win. I disagree with this idea that politics is only about winning an election at any cost. This must not be the new norms in our politics. And this is why I consistently made my stand to uphold the values of ethics and moral principles. At the inauguration of the new Jakarta governor, I came and congratulated directly Pa Anis Baswedan. And the next day, I also went to see Pa Basuki Cahaya Purnama, or popularly known as Ahok, to can convey my respect and appreciation for his leadership during his stint as the governor. I also reminded both Pa Anis dan Pa Ahok and Pa Ahok on the need for reconciliation to heal the wounds caused during the course of the election campaign. Through gestures such as this, I have to set a good example of demonstrating maturity in the way we conduct our democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to come back to the first part, the vision for Indonesia 2045. This will coincide with the centennial commemoration of the founding of the Republic. 27 years from now, not a long stretch by the measure of history. Such vision can only be achieved by preparing the next generation of Indonesians to have the capacity to adapt and overcome the challenges of the 21st century. The world we live today is very dynamic and rapidly evolving. Digital technology has brought dramatic changes in the ways people interact with each other across geographical borders and time zones. More than 3 billion people globally are now connected to the internet. In Indonesia, the number of internet users have reached over 132 million, or about 51% of the total population. And 92 million of those are active social mobile users. The internet, the internet changes the way people live their daily life. With online news and social media, people can seek and obtain a lot the information a lot faster and absorb a lot more than the previous generations could uh, ever could. Information is power. And now that power rests within the reach of our fingers. We are on the brink of the fourth industrial revolution. It is marked by the vision of technologies that blur the lines between the physical and the digital world. The impacts of the fourth industrial revolution affect the political, economic, as well as socio-cultural landscapes. First, let's look at the uh, political landscape. The rise of social media has enabled citizens to voice their opinions, shape public discourses, coordinate and mobilize efforts, as well as to engage the government in ways unthinkable before. When a local politician tweet online, the whole world can react and make their voices heard. This brings entirely different meaning to people's participation in the political process. Yes, there are positive and negative impacts here. On the upside, public opinion matters more now to the policymaking circles. In short, the internet provides a more egalitarian communication platform. You can be an active citizen and share your thoughts with community leaders or even the president of the country. However, there are downsides to this as well. In recent times, we have seen growing abuse of the internet and the social media. The spread of hoax, fake news, or any other format of disinformation have become growing concerns, especially in today's era of post-truth. Hate speech can quickly be broadcasted through the social media and messaging platforms, and they have the propensity to incite people into discrimination or even violence. These pose real risk to the harmony and unity of the country. 
We should be grateful that in the post-reform democratic era, after 1998, Indonesians ha have enjoyed greater degree of freedom, especially freedom in expressing our opinions and freedom in association. However, that freedom has to come with responsibilities as well. Freedom should not be expressed at the expense of others or of the freedom of others. Spreading false rumors or hoax should not be done on the pretext of the freedom of speech. And one must always remember that hate speech is not free speech. Secondly, let us review the shift in economic landscape. Recent technologies have enabled new opportunities to arise. The so-called digital economy has proved disruptive to many traditional large business businesses and provide avenues for newly emerging entrepreneurs. Ten years ago, people might have been skeptical about the prospects of e-commerce in Indonesia. But today, we are proud to see some homegrown digital startups graduating to become billion-dollar enterprises. Most people in Indonesia are now familiar with Gojek, Traveloka, Tokopedia, just to name a few, our successful local startups. Of course, the emerging digital economy also mean more than ever, the young generation need to prepare themselves for global competition. Digital businesses do not recognize the traditional geographical boundaries. Google, Facebook, Amazon, for example, they all have expanded to even far the greater corners of the world. Competition will come, whether we are ready or not. And I believe we can all agree that the key to success lies in the quality of our human resources. Education provides the foundation, but productivity and creativity will determine how well we can compete in the context of the new economy. Third, let us discuss the socio-political ramifications. I repeat, socio-cultural ramifications. The members of millennials' generation have a tendency to demand everything to happen instantly. You can order a product, watch movies and entertainment, get any information, contact friends and families with just a few clicks on your smartphone. However, there are downsides to this. It breeds the instant mindset. And instant gratification comes at a price. Many of our urban young population are unable to appreciate that some things do in fact take time and requires process to happen. And there are things in life that we should never take for granted. On the other hand, we also need to be cognizant that there could also be potentially further gap in our society. The access to technological know-how, incubation and funding for startups must not be limited to a few urban centers only. Surely, the government has accelerated the development of technology infrastructures across the country. Mobile telecommunication and internet penetration continues to increase faster. But moving forward, there is more to do, and we must not forget the human development aspects. If the gap remains, we will not be able to maximize the promising prospects of technology. So how should the young generation approach all these major challenges? The globalized world of the 21st century will certainly become a lot more competitive. The world population will grow from 7.5 billion people today to over 10 billion by 2050. And this will mean increased demand on natural resources, most notably water, food, and energy. Technology will be key to discovering new ways, new methods for mankind to meet these expanding needs. By understanding the complex global challenges, I consistently urge the young generation to prepare themselves by becoming adaptive to the changes that are coming. History shows that those who survive in natural selection are not necessarily the strongest or the biggest, but those who are the most adaptive. We have to be ready to play active roles in the ever-changing political, economic, as well as socio-cultural landscapes. With the purpose of preparing young generation of leadership that is capable of meeting 
the strategic challenges of the 21st century. In 2017, I have founded the Yudhoyono Institute. Our vision is to advance the cause of Indonesia to bring forward the country to a peaceful and prosperous future through synergy and collaboration. Its missions are threefold. First, we need to build on our young generation's intellectual capacity. Building intellectual capacity requires continuing transformation of our education system. Education is not just about teaching students by methods of road learning, but also through promoting a healthy sense of intellectual hunger and curiosity. So I thank you specifically to RSIS and NTU because from RSIS and NTU, I had the sense to always expand knowledge and to always be hungry to acquire more information so we can process everything better, especially before we make any decisions. We need to adopt the concept of lifelong learning, constantly looking to upgrade our knowledge and skills, even outside the scope of formal education. Only by doing so, we will be able to breed a new generation that is able to think, to create, and to innovate on their own. Second, the new, we need the young generation to have strong characters and integrity. High IQ alone is not enough. Young people of today need to have a never give up mentality and make bold decisions, as well as the willingness to take risks to serve a bigger purpose in life. Personal integrity is also important. Without a clear moral compass, we may end up misusing our talents and intellectual capacity. Last but not least, we need to have leadership quality. A leader is someone who has clear vision and the ability to persuade others to work together towards, towards that vision. To lead is to take the responsibility for others, even in the face of adversity. A good leadership will have a positive multiplier effect to the joint efforts of the group. Ladies and gentlemen, with these missions on hand, I have traveled to many parts of the country. All in all, I have visited 23 provinces and hundreds of cities and districts across the archipelago. During these visits, I had been invited to give public lectures at various universities and educational institutions. I had the opportunity to communicate my ideas and engage in discussions with thousands of students. I also sat down with the various youth organizations in nearly all the cities that I went to. Of course, during these visits, I also took the time to meet up with other elements of civil society, ranging from the farmers, fishermen, teachers, health workers, small-scale entrepreneurs, factory workers, housewives, disabled communities, to the religious communities, the clerics, and the santris. I took notes and learned many things from my visits. I gained insights on some of the local problems and opportunities, the aspiration and the hopes of the people. From the young generation, I learned about the current concerns that they have. Those who are at schools and universities are worried about gaining employment after they graduate, while those who have jobs are concerned about keeping their jobs. The relatively stagnant economy could make job security at risk for many of them. In the past two years, a number of major retailers are closing their shops and reducing their workforce nationwide. The commodity market also went on a sharp decline during the same period and caused layoffs in the provinces. Of course, Things are beginning to improve in recent times with the resurgence of the global commodity prices. Overall, the concerns of these young people are understandable, given that unemployment still stands at 5.5%, or 7 million people in absolute terms. Therefore, the government needs to take steps in ensuring the already large workforce, added with 3 million new job seekers every year, can be absorbed by the market and reach productivity level that is required to bring the economy forward. Overall, I still see the spirits of tenacity, optimism, and patriotism among these young people. 
And this infuses me with newfound confidence that we must work together with these young people and address their concerns for the future of the country. Collaboration is key to unlocking the potentials that Indonesia has. Ladies and gentlemen, for many Indonesians, young people especially, the world of politics seems so far detached from their daily lives. The very world of politics seems to have a negative connotation. It easily invites skepticism and less than flattering reactions. Although I do not necessarily subscribe to the views that everything from the price of beans, the rent that you pay, to every other aspect of ordinary citizens' life depend on political decisions, I do agree with the views that political ignorance for youth will be detrimental in the long run. This year, we commemorated the 20 year of Reformasi 1998. The Reformasi was only made possible with the young university students leading the way for political changes. The pictures of throngs of students rallying on the street and occupying the parliament house are still vivid in our memory. And if we were to go back further in history, we will see that Indonesians' youth have always consistently been the pioneers of this country. In 1908, for example, it was a group of young intellectuals who founded the first political movement called Budi Utomo. This marked the beginning of Indonesia's modern nationalism. In 1928, Sumpah Pemuda, or the Youth Pledge, was declared during the Second Youth Congress. The Sumpah Pemuda promoted the idea of a united Indonesia and had profound impacts on the nationalist movement. In 1945, it was a group of young people who urged Sukarno and Hatta, our founding fathers, into declaring the independence of our country. So you see, young people in Indonesia has always been at the front front of changes, and they are always present at critical junctures, junctures in our history. This is exactly why I urge many more young Indonesians to participate in the politics of the country to one degree or another, from coming to the ballots during the election day, actively participating in a political party, to even running for political offices. It was also one of the reasons why I finally joined the Democrat Party in February this year, I accepted the appointment as the head of Joint Task Force for the 2019 general election, or also known as the Kogasma. In this capacity, I now lead and coordinate the efforts of the Democrat Party with the objective of winning the general election next year. I want to set an example for young people to actively exercise their political rights. By doing so, we would be participating in setting the directions for the country moving forward, which in turn help decide the policy and will be formulated, that will be formulated and executed. Policies that will have impacts on the lives of all Indonesians. In the context of political contests, every political party in Indonesia nowadays talk about the importance of wooing millennials voters. Obviously, they are an important part of our demographics. It is estimated that the millennials between the age of 17 to 35 years old make up nearly 52% of all eligible voters in the country, or over 100 million people. Those are indeed a lot of potential votes, but I do hope that these parties are not just thinking of the millennial gen generation simply as objects. I seem to recall in the days of my campaign as the governor candidate, some of these parties were the first to point at my age and lack of experience in politics as the biggest handicaps. Today, you see some of those very same people fashion themselves in millennial styles and outfits and pretend to represent the youngsters. That brings a good laugh for me, actually. The good news is that we are now seeing an emerging pattern where youngsters are becoming more active politically. In the most recent Pilkada or regional elections 2018, we saw a number of governor and mayor candidates 
which put forward a combination of old and young pairs. In Cree provinces such as East Java, North Sumatra, and also a number of other cities and districts, we saw pairing of a seasoned politician or bureaucrat or former military officers with a much younger running mate. And a good number of them successfully won the elections. Take the case of Bukovifa and Mas Emil Dardak in East Java. This is a picture when I helped them to uh, campaign uh, in uh, Jombang, East Java. East Java, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this is the second largest uh, province in the country with around 40 million population. Bukovifa is a seasoned politician who has held two ministerial positions in the past, and this was her third time competing for the governor's seat. Only this time around, she paired up with Mas Emil Dardak, a 34-year-old regent who has just held office for two years. Bukoviva was able to rally traditional and more mature voters, whereas Mas Emil managed to appeal more to the younger voters. I'm sure it helped a bit that Mas Emil had the charm and good looks. It's important in Indonesia. It turned out to be a great winning combination in the end with a 7% margin or about 1 million votes. In North Sumatra, our fourth largest province, a former army general, Pa Edi Rahmayadi, paired, paired with uh, Rajak Shah, a relatively young local businessman and without any prior political experience. Again, the combination complemented each other and worked very well throughout the campaign. I personally took part in the campaign during the intense last few weeks. By the end of it all, they won by a solid lead of over 15%, despite a neck-to-neck -neck, uh, competition that occurred in the final days leading to the election. Youth has become a factor in the race. Why? The first reason is obviously the key demographics of the young people. They have the numbers on their side, and these are the people who are less inclined to follow traditional political lines. Also, just as importantly, people look towards the young candidates for their fresh approaches, energy, and stamina, as well as the drive to excel and the willingness to adapt to challenges. Perhaps we are bound to see similar pattern transpiring at national level in a general election next year. We see increasing number of young people registering to be candidates for the parliamentary seats. This gives the opportunities to younger generation of Indonesians to take active part in deciding the course of the country. As subjects and active players in our politics at national stage rather than just mere objects. Of course, I also encourage those young people who have the aspirations to pursue their dreams in other fields as well. Be that in science, education, medicine, engineering, diplomacy, culinary, arts and entertainment, or any other field of their own choosing. I always tell them that patriotism in the 21st century takes a different meaning than in the past. They do not need to raise arms or fight the war. There are many paths for them to contribute to the ideals of Indonesia 2045. And they will have made our country proud by exploring to the fullest of their talents potentials and opportunities that life provides. And the country needs all of them to excel in their respective fields. Only by having collaborations across all these elements, the nation can succeed. Last but not least, we need to impart those very same values and principles of our children and the generation that will come after them. Continuity and change. After all, we are doing all of this for our children, and they will do the same for their children. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I have high hopes and confidence that the young generation of Indonesia will be able to collaborate and work together towards a better future. I will not be, it will not be an easy journey, and it will require all of us to stand united along the way. Challenges will always appear, but together, we can make a better future towards a just and prosperous Indonesia for all of its people. I say to the young people, be ready always. 
always look for ways to expand our capacity, exercise self-discipline, work hard, and embrace the never give up mentality. One day, and that day may come soon, the country will need us, and we must be ready to answer that calling. I thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.